When I set out to write a composition, I'm often spending a great deal of time writing on paper. And that's kind of how they come to me, is very much in the descriptive form. It goes straight from lines on the paper notebook to Sibelius. Yep, yep. So I'm not working out anything on the piano. I go straight into Sibelius. So that, that written process is very, very important for me um, because it's the opportunity for me to really describe what I'm hearing in my mind as clearly as possible. And I write it, you know, colors, shapes, sounds, durations, everything. I, can, I describe it as if I'm doing a review of a concert, you know. I, I listen through it, describe it as, as clearly as possible. And as, as well as I do that, the, then by the time I'm actually composing, it happens really fast. It goes really quickly. Whereas if I just went straight to composing, I would just be, okay, what note comes next? What note comes next? You know, so I like to think through a composition so that it, I really have a sense of it as an entirety first, beginning, middle, end. How, where, where does it rise and fall? What, it, what are the high points, the low points? Where are the cadences? Really feel itself as an organic whole before I actually write a single note. People say, what do you mean Martin Feldman's an influence on your music? I don't, I don't get it. You know, you're, you're all over the place, you know, and in terms of the, the language and the, the rhythmic um, punchiness of my music is much more connected to jazz. But um, the sound world, the textures, the layers, the, the way he orchestrates, those are all things that I, I spent a lot of time um, studying in the early 90s and then kind of developing my own style around that. So it's really across my music. I think if you follow it, the thread, if you kind of know that's something of what I'm doing, um, working with rhythmic juxtaposition and layering and um, sort of that interdependence of, of modal line and melody within real dense textures is something I'm very fascinated with. That's your primary um, objective as an opera composer is to tell the story. So you want to always make sure that people can understand it. So in terms of the the way the recitatives are written, the way the singers are interacting, the way I orchestrate, all of that is is very much in service to making sure that it's coming across. So it's simplified way, way, way down. When you when you enter into the opera world, you've got singers who not only are they having to learn the music, memorize the music, but they're also acting. And that's a tremendous amount of um, process that the singer has to go through in a very short period of time. And it's a remarkable one to witness. To see them on book 
and then the next night they're off book and then to see them perform it where they just become those characters is really um, I have so much respect for them and their ability to do that because that's that's a a, a very tall order. That's something that a chamber musician, you know, you've always got your score in front of you and but they're learning blocking and they're having to be in character and they've got to listen to the conductor and they've got to follow what's going on and they've got to remember everything. And So you want to be as, as um, giving to them as possible. You know, lead their, you know, if you're doing big tonality shifts, make sure they've got things to listen for. Um, you know, creating cues basically. Not, I mean, I, if I created dissonances, always backing it up with something that they could anchor with. Um, very, very important. So you always have to be aware of that. You can't just be as completely free as you are with instrumental music. Or even just, you know, a, a, a chamber piece where you've got somebody who's going to sit down and really study your score and you've got crazy intervallic relationships, but they, you know, can take the time to really learn that. The, the, the opera objective is very different. Where do you get these crazy ideas, Stephen? We are people of the soil. We will farm. Why come to America to live in the past? I hate farming. <laughs> Music in our family, look what you made me do. I dropped my only chisel. I can't believe you even brought that. I am a wood carver. You have no respect for tradition or our homeland. <laughs> One of the most interesting things I think about being a composer is those feelers that you have um, are always alert. And so even when you're taking time off, go for a walk or whatever, to me your compositional mind is still working. Well, I've certainly gotten very local um, in, in the last two years, um, planting myself very much in the east side, the sort of the native plants of Minnesota, growing them here on my land. and. Um, getting to know the community in a very personal way, getting out of the new music ghetto was something I very much wanted to do and to interact with people that really had no idea what I was doing. I think our whole view of the composer is, is so limited um, uh, and it doesn't need to be that way. I think um, being involved in the community is a really, really important thing to do and because of the way we think, we're, we're problem solvers, you know, we, we solve puzzles, that's kind of what our job is as a composer, is kind of thinking things backwards and forwards and from all these different angles. So I think we can be involved in the community in non-traditional ways. And um, so that's something that's very interesting to me, is integrating my, my work as a composer with, you know, the, the work of the community that I live in. Mm -hmm. 